This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Ceremonies have been held across the U.S. to mark the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terror attacks. Painful memories from the past still linger presently as the world looks forward to a safer future. We have lined up comprehensive coverage of the impact of terrorism since 9-11. Welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi, also ahead on the program. Pressure builds on military junta in Guinea to restore constitutional order. And we tell you why dogs are becoming more than just a friendly companion in Nigeria. We begin in the U.S., where Americans have been commemorating the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terror attacks. President Joe Biden visited the terror site of the 9-11 tragedy. He began his tour at the former World Trade Center's Twin Towers in New York. Also present at the ceremony were former Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. Former President George Bush led Americans at a gathering in Shanksville. The leaders held a moment of silence in honor of the victims. In 2001, 19 terrorists hijacked four planes, crashing them into iconic buildings, including the Pentagon and the Twin Towers, leaving about 3,000 people dead. We can now cross over to our correspondent, John Terrat. He's in New York uh, for us. John, what are some of the key highlights of events marking the 20th year since the 9-11 attacks? Yes, 20 years. Remarkable how the time has gone, isn't it, Beatrice? Look, I think the first thing to point out is just notice behind me, this is the West Side Highway that you see. And on the other side of it is now the footprints of the North and South Tower. And that highway has three names in America. To the north of Manhattan, it's called the West Side Highway. Down here in downtown, where I am looking out the window now, it's known as West Street. But many New Yorkers call it the Highway of Heroes because it was on that road that you see where the cars are now moving now that the event is over that so many people stood and tried to rescue on that first day people that they thought at that point might still be alive inside the pile. You know, this is a very, very long event. It starts about 8.30 in the morning and it's only just wrapped up. It's now one o'clock in the afternoon here. And the focal point of the whole day really is the reading of the names of the deceased. And the families couldn't do it last year because of COVID-19 restrictions. So they were pleased to be able to do it because these families, they don't live in each other's pockets. They don't meet during the course of the year, but they do come here on the anniversary for some you know, consolation and companionship and a sense of closure, which they certainly get. So three presidents witnessed the events here today, President Biden, President Obama and President Clinton. President Carter is at home in Georgia, where, of course, he's very frail these days. President Trump is telling Fox News that he will come here later today. And President Bush is in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, as you've already said. The highlights, six bells, six key moments when the towers came down and the planes went in. And Bruce Springsteen, Beatrice, I don't know how popular Bruce Springsteen is in Africa, but here he is a megastar, very, very popular, especially in the state of New Jersey, which is next door to where we are now. And Bruce Springsteen popped out out of nowhere. Nobody announced him. Nobody knew he was coming. He just got on the stage and sang a song called I'll See You In My Dreams, which I suspect is how many people who were bereaved that day see their loved ones all these years later. Biden's now in Shanksville. He's just left a wreath in remembrance of those who died there on Flight 93. He, uh, what have we got here? We've got, he just laid a wreath. Uh, Kamala Harris, who's the vice president, was there. She made a speech calling for a united America. George Bush, who I said made a speech, has warned about domestic terrorism, violence that gathers within, he talked about. And finally, just briefly, why does this event keep happening year after year after year? I think it's because it was a major television event. We all remember seeing it 20 years ago. It sparked three wars, what happened here and at the Pentagon and at Shanksville, Afghanistan, Iraq, and also the war on terror. And the other thing is that there are 1,100 people who were here on that day, who came to work, who just vanished. They've just gone. No one knows where they are. They've never been seen again. And that reason alone prompts these families to come back here to what for them is hallowed ground, because it's a chance to just 
be in the same space as their loved ones who obviously died that day. Beatrice? Mm, John, and, and, and so much has happened over the last uh, 20 years as well. But if we just come back to uh, a little bit on the U.S. war on terror itself, 20 years on though, is the U.S. confident its war on terror has made the country more secure? And how is the recent pullout of troops from Afghanistan likely to inform its future engagement and its future policy? Well, you know, Beatrice, I think those are two excellent questions. And the first thing I would say is that I think Americans to this day are genuinely very, very nervous as a result of what happened here. You've only got to have a plane fly low inadvertently over no lower Manhattan. And people look up in the sky and they wonder, you know, is this all going to be happening again? And you have to remember that 20 years ago, Americans felt very, very safe in their country because they felt that they had Canada, a friendly nation to the north, Mexico, a friendly nation to the south, the Atlantic Ocean to their east and the Pacific Ocean to their west. And they simply, I mean, nobody was ever anticipating anything remotely like this happening. There had been an explosion at this site about 10 years earlier. But nobody thought that aeroplanes were going to be used as missiles, which is what happened. And so there was a real loss of innocence. And I say that that is maintained even today. Now, the Afghanistan pullout was botched, OK? I'm afraid there is no other way to say it. It was a complete botched job. They got it wrong. It was badly handled. And because of that, America now really lacks credibility with its allies in the region and in NATO. And I think that the pullout of Afghanistan is seen as a wider pullout of the Middle East region, including Afghanistan. Now, Lindsey Graham is a very well-known hawkish senator from the state of South Carolina. He's telling the BBC right now the U.S. will be going back to Afghanistan. We will return to Afghanistan because the terror threat is so high. So already there's talk about somehow the U.S. going back in. On the other hand, Joe Biden is saying, look, I'm not second guessing myself. I think I was absolutely right to do what I did. I think the pullout debacle would have happened anyway whenever we did it. And the other thing to point out is that despite those hawkish comments from Lindsey Graham and other Republicans, it is true also to say that for the first time in years, in a lifetime in many cases, America is no longer involved in a shooting war. So we'll have to wait and see, Beatrice. All right, uh, John Terrett for us there uh, from New York. Thank you. A loss of innocence indeed for the United States and uh, for Africa too. This was a tragedy that was hard to miss across the continent. CGTN's Enoxicolia now looks at lessons that African countries can learn from the not so successful U.S. engagement in Afghanistan. The Taliban's rapid takeover of power in Afghanistan hit the global headlines in recent weeks. And that has raised many concerns in Africa, where terror groups have been on the rise. There is fear that these groups are finding ways and places to reorganize and thrive, despite military interventions. Security experts like Dr. Mustafa Ali, who wrote on the changing dynamics of terrorism and violent extremism, are talking about a scenario where a country with an unstable government like Mali will be overwhelmed by militia groups. That's the challenge that uh, we in Africa are going to have to deal with because many other groups might look at the successes of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and others and think that they can uh, uh, emulate them. I think we've seen in the messaging channels of some groups, a group like Al-Shabaab, they've been reporting about the developments in Afghanistan quite a bit and really taking pride in what's happening there. So I think there's that inspiration factor. Insurgencies in Africa have three main geographical areas of oppression. One is Somalia, where the Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Shabaab group has for years created instability in bordering regions of Kenya and is now inspiring violent groups in Mozambique and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The second is the Sahel region of West Africa with the border region of Mali. Burkina Faso and Niger particularly affected. Last is the area around Lake Chad, with the conflict directly impacting Cameroon, Chad and Nigeria. Ali and Mahmoud agree that events in Afghanistan should be looked at keenly by African states, given that many Western nations are becoming extremely reluctant 
to increase their engagement in fighting terror groups after the fall of Afghanistan. France plans to start slashing its military presence in West Africa by about half over the next year. The mandate of the UN-backed peacekeeping mission in Somalia comes to an end in December this year. Experts are seeing a chilling parallel to the Afghanistan fiasco. If you're going to take away the boots of the ground, then what happens is that the terrorists again fill that vacuum and it becomes counterproductive. The problem with the West is that they have always prioritized boots on the ground. He says this is why the U.S. response in Afghanistan after the September 11 attack was bound to fail. We need these boots on the ground, but they need to be uh, complemented, supplemented by very robust programs to address the ideological foundations to terrorism, to address grievances, to, to ensure that communities uh, uh, are moving uh, uh, away from poverty, are moving away from conflictual situations. We've often ignored the wider environment in which uh, some of these groups have, have thrived and really been able to implant themselves. And so that means looking at the underlying conditions. The hope is that 20 years after the September 11 terror attack in the U.S., Africa has learned a lot from the way America and Western countries have been responding to the threat of terror. Enoxicolia, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. And we're staying with that story for the moment. Dr. Ivan Yenda Ilunga, who is a professor of political science at the Central State University, is now joining me via Zoom from Ohio in the United States. Dr. Ilunga, thank you for joining us. A somber moment indeed across the United States today. So how has the war against terror changed since the 9-11 attack? Well, thank you so much for, for having me. As you said, uh, it is a very somber time for the U.S., but also for the world. Of course, to the question of uh, the way the war on terror has changed, uh, I would say there are three major uh, transformations that one can look at as from now. The first one is that uh, there has been a multiplication of uh, harm groups or terrorist groups or terrorist organizations. Uh, that is an important element to, 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 to keep uh, emphasizing on since uh, in the 20, uh, 2001, uh, the only target, at least the most uh, uh, powerful one was Al-Qaeda. But of course, things have changed. Now you have a widespread of different terrorist organizations. And the second element in the change of war on terror is that uh, now countries are dealing with uh, regionalized uh, type of uh, act of terror and uh, cross-border or transnational terrorist organizations, and which is, I think, is very difficult to, to, to deal with when you think of places such as uh, Mali in the Central African uh, region. Uh, these are critical elements. And the third point, which I think has also characterized this change, is uh, the fast-evolving ideologies. So there is not only one single and well-interpreted ideology when it comes to terrorist uh, approach and uh, uh, strategies, but now so countries have to deal with all this and the nations have to adapt. So it's a very difficult type of asymmetric and changing war that uh, we are dealing with now. So Africa has seen its fair share of insurgencies over the last 20 years as well when it comes to that multiplication of terror groups that you mentioned. But has the U.S. response to international terror threats created more security challenges in places like Africa, for instance? Yeah, I'll say there is, a, there is an element of it. But we have, first of all, to get back to the fact that uh, uh, on the security landscape, uh, Africa had its own issues before even uh, this increased manifestations of a terrorist organization. Countries in Africa had issues of intrastate conflict, ethnic conflict, and uh, many other type of or dynamics internal to Africa. Yes, uh, those were very much uh, unique and uh, proper to African continent, but, and uh, they affected, of course, the landscape or the security landscape of the continent. But the U.S. response to uh, international terrorism, I think, has only had another layer to 
uh, the security landscape of Africa, which becomes now an angle of prioritizing uh, counter-terrorist and counter-insurgency approach uh, on uh, the security front. So, but again, I have to say right. uh, there is an angle there, but uh, Africa had only had its own issues on the security landscape before uh, the U.S. responses to uh, terrorists internationally. So what has been found to be working when it comes to dealing with the challenge? Is there room for dialogue with extremists or is a military approach the most effective in the war against terror? Well, I would say that yeah, there is always room for dialogue, but we have to be also clear on that front. So when we talk about extremists and terrorists, sometimes uh, we try to mix them but other times they are very different. So yes, there are rooms for dialogue with extremist organizations in internal countries who, for instance, see uh, government or the institutions as not being able to, to respond to their requests, so either it's at the social, political, or economic level. But with terrorists, that is another angle which I think there is no much room to hit. But again, we have also to add on it that uh, over the years, there have been limits uh, uh, on uh, military right. approaches and interventions. And the case of uh, Afghanistan can tell us that the military approaches are not always effective. So Africa should basically, I think, focus more on other angles of uh, dialogue, which may be institutional dialogue between communities that are frustrated, which are easily uh, targeted by the terrorist organization in terms of recruitment, so the government should more uh, focus on uh, dealing with those type of frustrations rather than uh, securitizing and militarizing the political sta uh, spaces all the time. Dr. Ivan Yenda Ilunga joining us via Zoom from Ohio in the United States. Well, back home, the Boko Haram insurgency has lasted for over a decade. The group began launching attacks in northern Nigeria. Beyond carrying out the devastating attacks, the group also kidnapped hundreds of girls and students. We talked to one of their victims, Fatima Buba Saleh. She spent years in captivity before she was able to escape with her child. Then before insurgency, life was quiet and peaceful in my small hometown, Goza. Then I lived with my family and was featuring to attend a, a local school where I learned very little English. One of the Boko Haram, I was adopted by insurgency. Then who pretend to give me a lift to one of the nearby village. We dropped one of their of their village, namely Kamzuro. The first day we arrived in their four group for men and approached me and one them asked me to take off my cloth and lie down. I just saw each one of them had their way, they raped me, all of them, four. I was leave all myself. I never know I was pregnant. I don't even know what pregnancy is all about. <laughs> After all, I was just 18 years that time. I have four years in the forest. Then I will marry three men. I was a girl on 2019. I was going with my baby. My baby that time we have a three years and a half. I went to go out of the forest. It is Sarah at my baby on my back. I escaped from Boko Haram captivities. I meet of so I meet I meet of group of for of soldier when asking me where where I going. I told them so that I escaped from the insurgency captivities. I came from the forest. I stay in military barrack. I stay at four months in the military barrack. The story of Fatima Abuba Asale. Well, here in Kenya, 21st 
of September 2013 is the day gunmen stormed the popular Westgate Mall. At least 67 people were killed by Al-Shabaab militants in that terror attack. We talked to Ben Mulwa, a survivor of the attack. He touched on how the experience has changed him. This was really a life-changing moment for me because it was just a regular Saturday like any other. I was stepping out for lunch with a, a, a friend of mine. And when the attack started, it was not anything near what any of us had ever imagined. But uh, it dawned on me for the first time in life that uh, terrorism was not only real, uh, but it is something that could affect anybody, anywhere, anytime. And ever since that day, it has been um, it has been a transformation in my life in not only appreciating each and every day, but also um, realizing that all of us really have a role not only to play towards the security of ourselves as individuals, but also the security of our the respective countries. Uh, ever since, I have realized that I am uh, extra cautious in terms of the environment where I am. I became extremely conscious about uh, activities in any public space that I am, even in, in private spaces. Um, because I, as, as somebody who works in the public, I am always in places where they are, they are, uh, I realized could be easy targets for terrorism. So um, I have become extremely conscious. And one thing that I am very happy about is that there has been a lot of enhanced uh, security around all public installations. There is uh, continuous um, surveillance. And most importantly, I think the Kenyan government has invested heavily in intelligence systems. One of the key things that I believe our security agencies really should focus on is enhanced intelligence gathering. Uh, you realize terrorists don't operate in isolation and they don't fall from the sky. They operate with networks. And most of the times we have seen, especially in their recruitment processes, they target young people who are desperate, especially unemployed and uh, who are looking for opportunities. So enhanced intelligence systems is really the way to go. Uh, secondly, uh, there is the need to improve on equipping our security agencies. Uh, you remember, that, for example, the incident of the Garissa University attack, where it took security agencies more than eight hours to reach Garissa University, which is only about 45 minutes flight from Nairobi. So equipping our security agencies better would uh, go a long way in either thwarting this incident or responding better when an attack occurs. And in other stories uh, making headlines across the continent, let's head to Guinea where delegates from the economic community of West African states have held uh, talks with the new military ruler, Lieutenant Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya in Conakry. The Friday meeting came amid rising diplomatic pressure from the international community following the recent coup. Earlier on, the new leader had met with members of ECOWAS. He had joined the team of mediators drawn from Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, and Burkina Faso. The regional bloc has been critical of the coup and has even threatened sanctions. The team expressed optimism over a possible return to constitutional rule as demanded by ECOWAS after suspending it from the group. It is also demanding an assurance on the safety of ousted President Afakonde. Nigerians living in the north central state of Plateau are getting trained dogs to protect them from kidnappers and armed robbers. They have to spend more to get the skilled animals, but they say it's worth it for their personal safety. Tese Makende reports from Jos in Nigeria. 26 year old Idoga Idoga, a resident of Jos in north central Nigeria, owns two security trained dogs in his house. He says he acquired them due to the increased crime rate in the city. I had a friend who was kidnapped not too long ago. And if you ask me, keeping a dog is way cheaper than paying ransom. I got these dogs actually to help me feel safe, to secure me. If the condition of the country doesn't change anytime soon, these dogs, although Alex and Chloe might go at some point, but dogs will always be a part of my life. More than 70 people were killed last month alone in twin attacks in Jaws. 
Many residents of the city are now acquiring guard dogs for their homes to help watch out for criminals. These dogs, Chloe and Alexa, have been with Idoga and his family for two years. He says the dogs have done well in alerting them to impending dangers in their neighborhood. Bamike Kainde keeps and trains hybrid security dogs for sale in the city. He says the demand for the skilled dogs has increased in recent months due to rising insecurity. The people in and out of just are buying dogs because they see the need for security. Formerly it was just as pets in the house, but now you can't have a dog in the house and someone um, just walks into your compound like that. The person must be armed or really prepared before he can walk into your compound. So the need to own a dog has really increased and business-wise too, good. Bamika says dogs are great assets as they help protect lives and property. He recommends breeds like German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois and Rottweilers as they are very effective guard dogs. I'd rather have two or three dogs in my house than to hire a security man to guard me. A security man will slip off. A security man could be bribed. A security man could be let as in just free. He can easily let you sell you out. But your dog is always loyal and your dog will give its life for you. Security experts are urging the government to do more to protect the citizens. The Plato State Government in June this year procured and distributed 50 new patrol vehicles and 200 motorcycles to security agencies in the state. The move is aimed at boosting the capacity of the agencies to tackle crime, including attacks on people. But until that is done, residents of Jos, like Idoga Idoga, say they will continue to own dogs to enhance their safety from criminals. Tessum Akendi, CGTN Jos, Nigeria. And a quick look at your sport news. Cristiano Ronaldo scored a brace.